Emily Bybee, welcome to the Rocky Mountain Writer Podcast. Thank you. Great to have you on. We have uh, a couple of things to discuss. A brand new book just came out uh, this month, I do believe, earlier this month, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, and May 5th. May 5th. Congratulations. Book number four. Yes, four in the series. Four in the series. So we're going to dive into that a little bit, and then we're going to talk about your newsletter class and through RMFW Online University that comes um, coming up, starts June 1. And um, we'll try to get some folks interested in that class and why newsletters are important um, for every writer out there. Um, and, but I think we, at the outset, need to establish the fact that you are in a under renovation basement, right? <laughs> Just so people know in the background here. Yes, I, I, I'm currently not working in an office of any sort. And this is the only place in my house that we would not have puppies barking or um, visiting children or teenage children, for that matter, interrupting things. So <laughs> that's the backdrop. And what will this space ultimately become? Is it is it being renovated or is it just this is the way it looks? Actually, yeah, I kicked my husband out of the basement. Um, he was he was doing he was running some electrical um, so that we could do the podcast. Um, but it, this is this will probably be I don't he's thinking pool room. I don't know that we'll ever get a pool table in here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, additional bedroom or you know slash family area. Great. So, and yeah. where do you live? Uh, so we're in Castle Rock. Um, we moved down here about gosh, has it been, oh my gosh, 17 years ago. Yeah. We've been in Castle Rock. Um, yeah. And we, we love it down here. Although like every place is getting, you know, very busy and there's yeah. a lot of building going on. Yeah. So, um, traffic is always getting worse, but yeah, but, yeah. but it's beautiful. And, um, my youngest is going to be finishing high school here in a couple of years. And my middle son is going off to college in the fall and yeah. A lot of life has happened in Castle Rock. That's great. That's great. Well, we want to dive into things. Um, and I think one of the themes of this episode and chat might today might be perseverance based on your last 15, 14, 15 months or so and what you've been through. Um, so we'll dial folks in on that. But let's just focus on the celebration for now, which has to do with the release of book number four. So tell us about the series and how this book fits in. Uh, so book number four is Droplets of Magic. Um, the series is the Unstable Magic series, uh, but it, they're, they are about, it's, it's books about defective witches. So witches whose spells blow up in their face or cause earthquakes or cause storms. Um, so it's a little bit of elemental magic, but each book is, um, is a standalone. So they have different main characters. Um, you can read them out of order. And I've actually had multiple people, um, even reviews on Amazon of people I don't know that are like, oh yeah, I read this out of order. It was totally fine. Um, so I wanted, I want each book to, to you know, you'd be able to pick it up and say, I, I understand the backstory enough. And I get the hint that there's more to this world that she's hinting about, but I don't have to know it to get through this story. And then it was really important for me to have each of my characters have their own battle that feeds into the overarching series battle. Um, but first they kind of have to face their own, their own demons or, you know, face their own, you know, get their own triumph and have their own arc. And then they, we move on with this series of, um, I call them the defects is what the witch world calls them in my stories. Um, and once we get the five defects together, then they can fight the big bad series, you know, enemy. Yeah. What, what are the titles of the first three books? Just so we get that on, on here. Uh, so Fractured Magic is the first book. Uh, and then there's Fatal Magic and then Echoes of Magic. Um, and then Droplets of Magic is the, is the fourth. And then I'm hoping that I can get Escape from Magic um, out sometime this fall. That's what I'm hoping. Um, and then so this is actually, it was supposed to be a five book series and then it was a six book series and now it might be a seven book series. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cause it just keeps growing. Yeah. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping to be able to um, increase my pace of writing as we'll just see what the year brings. 
Right. When did the whole idea of defective witches occur to you? I really, you know, so the first incarnation of Fractured Magic, she was not a defective witch. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized it was really actually a, after I had finished it and rewritten it three times, I realized that what I was really writing about was um, like, if there's a moral to these, it's that being different isn't bad. And I was, I didn't realize it when I was writing it, but we were going through horrible bullying with my oldest son who is on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And he was just, I mean, horrible bullying in middle school, middle school and high school. And um, I, I, I was, I wrote this witch character who is completely looked down on in her world and just, you know, really treat, mistreated. And I realized I was writing about my son um, because he's amazing and he's so creative and he's so smart, but in a normal school environment, he's completely unappreciated and having the social sort of um, hiccups that he does, or he can't read facial expressions as well, you know, that causes a lot of social bullying. So he was trying, he tried so hard in school and he's so bright. Um, but it's like the first story is kind of about this girl who thinks she is like, you know, she's the worst witch ever. And people say she's just a, a, you know, the universe is joke on her parents, like, just like whatever. And, and you find out, no, there's actually something really special about her. And if you get to know her, you'll find that out. And I didn't think about it while I was writing it, but it, I think it was my own emotions um, coming through in my writing, which I, I think as writers, we, you know, we realize that happens more often than we even realize. Right. But uh, so, I mean, yeah, that's sort of the, the books is like, you know, these, these witches are supposedly defects and the, but they're not really, you know, yeah. they're actually, you know, something really special about each one of them. Fantastic. And once you tap that emotional side, it sounds to me like you realized you had a more a richer character a more complex character to deal with perhaps oh yeah i mean anybody who's dealt with being looked down on not being respected and and um feeling like they were a burden on their parents which is nothing you ever want your children to feel which my son went through um yeah there's a whole lot of emotion there um yeah. So, yeah. So that first book is very, very, very much so. And, and the other thing about it too, is, um, that, that, that did was, is me is that I, that I pour into my books. It, it's fine. Cause I'm, I, my science, my background is science. <laughs> I never took a writing class, not one. Um, I don't, I never took a grammar class either, which my editor would probably really know. Cause I, I'm not good with commas, but science always comes through in my books. So my witches are very much based in science the magic is based in science um i'm always talking about molecules and like yeah. <laughs> chemistry of it um yeah. that's always coming through in my books too so. and yeah i want to hear a little bit about um the fact that you're a two-time winner of the colorado um, gold writing contest that's connected to the mm -hmm. conference correct mm -hmm. yeah can you talk a little bit about um the timing of when you won those awards and then did that lead to your um deal with your publisher for the first three books um no so, fra so fractured magic was the first one um the second time that's actually with a romantic suspense that i that i have written that i've had um a revise and resubmit request from entangled publishing twice and i still need to that was supposed to happen this last year. I was supposed to revise it. I got halfway through revision and resubmit. I, I'm overdue on resubmitting that one, but that's, um, but I, I did meet Rhonda Penners from Wild Rose Press at the conference. Um, it didn't necessarily have anything to do with the contest. Um, it was more, she didn't have that many pitch sessions um, filled up and I would talk to her in the elevator and she was like, let's go sit down and talk and, um, and, and that started that. And then she said, you know, definitely send me your, send me your query letter and, um, and a, uh, some, uh, your first 50 pages. She moved, she passed it along to her fantasy editor, um, who's Amanda. And the funny thing is, is that my editor, she never had done any YA. She didn't think she liked YA. Um, she looked at my query letter and was like, oh, this is a YA submission. I don't need any more authors right now. I'm not going to take it. And then she told me that um, 
that as she was reading through, she kept being like, oh, darn it, <laughs> darn it. I'm going to have to take this. Like, oh, darn it, I'm going to have to take this. And so I was her first YA um, wow. writer nice. that she ever took on. Nice. Yeah. yeah that's very cool. I do so, think the conference more gave me um, a little bit of validation though, or the con the contest yeah. so gave me some validation and, and like, okay, I'm at least on the right track here. Um, because I, I, you know, like I said, I was not a creative writing major. Right. No, that's a huge accomplishment to come out of um, science and sort of pick up writing when you did and go on and win that contest twice. Terrific. Uh, yeah, the plan had been medical school, um, yeah. but, then, but then it turned into marriage and children. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. then, um, and then it was writing because my oldest son with his um, sensory processing stuff that was going on and we didn't know at the time, he would only nap on my chest. Mm -hmm. And I got really sick of watching Judge Judy because we didn't have cable. And I couldn't move. And so I had a notebook and that's when I started writing. And then, so I wrote my first book in a notebook. Um, and that was a historical ro romance that will never see the light of day. Um, yeah. And so that got me back into writing. Um, Cause I, just, I couldn't move. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of interruptions to your writing schedule, um, you know, I want to ask you about the last um, year plus which has been very challenging for you. And I think is a testament to your now dedication to writing. It sounds like to me anyway, because you're back at it despite two major challenges in the last year. Do you want to start with the accident? Yeah, I would say if, you know, I think we always put a little bit of blood, sweat and tears into our books, but with droplets, it took a lot of blood, sweat and tears for me. Um, I had been on a deadline to get droplets to my editor. And then in April, um, got in a rear end, got rear ended by a UPS truck. Um, and that accident, oh uh, gosh, aggravated previous conditions that were, had been healed. And it gave me a whole host of new, new things. Um, there was a couple months after the accident that I couldn't write because of the concussion. Mm. Um, which was very frustrating because uh, then I missed my deadline. Um, and it just, it took, gosh, it took just doing a little bit at a time and just trying every day and then, you know, keeping on and then having procedures. I'm, I would say over the last year, I've had an average of five to seven doctor's appointments every week, um, which is basically a full-time job. And then, yeah. you know, I think 10 sets of spinal injections and I've got a lot more coming. Um, but between the accident and then finding out about the cancer in August and then that surgery and the medications. And if anybody saw me at conference last October, I apologize because yeah, my, uh, my thyroid hormone was so high and I was in a constant panic attack the whole time. So I was probably a little bit of a freak. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it was, it was a lot of blood, sweat and Cheers. I do think having that goal because there was so little I could do. I couldn't, I couldn't get up and cook dinner for my family, which is something I've always done. I could, my, I, my house was the dirtiest it's ever been in my life. Teenagers yeah. do not like to clean. Yeah. I don't know what the problem is. Yeah. Don't ever ask your teenagers to become maids. Um, it does not work. Uh, and they, my, my kids are really helpful, but they can only do so much. So there was so little I could do that, you know, being able to get in a position with all these pillows propped up where I could at least escape my brain for a bit and work on my story. It does give you some sense of control in a time in my life where I feel like I had none. Mm -hmm. um, it, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's still going on. Um, I don't know how much longer all these injections and things are going to be lasting, but it sounds like for a while um, wow. I'm hoping we'll figure out some, some relief soon because sleep sleep is really important. <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! Oh, well, my heart goes out to you, Emily. Yeah. Wow. Did you find yourself um, still thinking about your characters and your plots? Was that a um, a place for your mind to go, even though you couldn't build sentences or paragraphs for a while? Actually yeah, I came up with, so right. It's really funny. Cause right now and my critique group could tell you, like, I've, I've read the beginnings of like five different stories because I kept coming up with these plots that I loved, 
but actually sitting down and being able to focus on the words and the writing and, and um, you know, my, because my head snapped side to side, my speech center was affected a bit. Um, so coming up with those right words is so hard right now. Um, and it's so, some of them are so silly too. Uh, but it's, but it's like, I have all these ideas and, and it's like, I'm fleshing out characters on my mind and stories that I want to write. And I want to get down and, and, you know, be that person that's sitting there and they're writing several thousand words a day. Um, and it's just, it's, it's like, I'll, I'll be able to go for a little while and then no, I got to stop. And, and so that part is really frustrating, but the, it's like the creativity is still there. The creative part of my brain is still there and it is like full force. Um, the actual sit down, type it out, get it in a coherent manner. That's been, that's been a lot more of the struggle. But, um, one thing that's really cool about droplets is that when I did end up going, um, to self publish it because my publisher said they might not be able to get it out till 2023. And I knew I was losing readers by the day. Um, so I decided I'm like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to self publish this sucker. Um, I had so much support, um, from people, um, for one, one of the main, one of the big ones, um, Bernadette Marie with five Prince publishing. I, I messaged her and she was like, so supportive. And just like, if you have questions, you just ask me. And she was amazing. Yeah. She's um, amazing. <laughs> yeah. Just to give me the earth, the confidence to even do it because part of me is like, I'm a mess right now. I can't, what, how am I supposed to figure out self publishing too, on top of everything else? Um, I also had, you know, my critique group, um, Jim, um, Jim and Christina and my critique group are amazing critiquers. And then, um, my friend, Michelle Kellogg, she formatted the book for me. Um, and then another critique partner, um, Chelsea Evenstar, who's, uh, she's an NFT 3d artist. Uh, she did the cover wow. and, and it's really, it's an amazing cover. And she did yeah. that, you know, to just, you know, to be supportive, help me out, like help me get this going. Um, it's been, and then my best friend from college copy edited it for me. Wow. Um, it was a really a group effort. So having these people that I knew I could, I could count on, they all came together to help me get this book out in somewhat of a timely manner. And I think I did a few things backwards. Like I've learned, you know, a couple things <laughs> about how to, how to self-publish versus, you know, your timeline. Um, but it was, it was really, it was really nice to know that like, there are these people that, that care enough to take time out of their lives to, to, you know, really help me out. So yeah, that's amazing. Wow. And you're glad you didn't wait for your previous publisher to publish it next year. I, you know, on honestly too, I did, I lost a lot of readers. Yeah. This is, it really affected it. Um, the launch was not what I had hoped, but I'm trying not to be, you know, to, down about that it's it is what it is i can regain those people i'll get some mar more marketing going as i'm figuring that out um that's not something really a wild rose you know with most publishers they don't really do a lot of marketing anyway um but yeah that and and you know there was some some stuff that happened at the end of april right before the launch that it was like my marketing plan went poof oh, no. so, but you know it can we can you can come back from that and I'll, i'm getting it going um just trying to take things a day at a time and if i have a setback i'm trying not to beat myself up about it uh as you know as much as we can right. um and and just kind of roll with it and figure all right i didn't get that done today but you know maybe tomorrow will be better yeah so are you able to produce fiction on a regular basis now today um so this last month I had, I have not, I had not written in a month and I tried this morning and I was actually able to sit down and write, um, there, we had some bad news about some tendons in my neck, possibly not being able to be injected because they're too close to the brain stem is, you know, it's like, it's stuff that it's like, you don't want to hear. So it really dampened my creativity. Um, I used to be able to produce, I mean, there was one weekend I did a writing like a, a mini nano. I wrote 25,000 words in a weekend before the accident. So I used to be very prolific. This has been a real uh, wake up call. <laughs> I don't know what to even call it. It's, it's been a real setback because I can't produce the amount of words that I used to, to produce. I can't focus as much as I used to. And then there's just so much stuff going on and so much emotion and so much, and pain just brings, pain brings a whole new, a whole new realm of um, 
just trying to deal with things. It just, it saps your energy so badly and not sleeping at night saps your energy so badly. So sometimes just getting through the day is what I do and yeah. that, but writing has been what's always made me happy. And if I write in a day, that's what makes me happy. And it has gotten me through a lot of really painful days to be able to escape into my, my pretend world. Yeah. So do you think what's happened to you in the last year has colored, altered, um, somehow influenced your narrative voice at all? Um, <laughs> okay, so that's kind of funny. Yeah, um, Droplets of Magic is probably the darkest story I've ever written. Um, I would say my my work is very much typically sweet paranormal romance, um, not a ton of violence. There are much more. There are several more people who die in this book, mm -hmm. and they have kind of bloodier deaths. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's frustration with the world, but yeah, it, I mean, not to the point that it's horror or anything like that. Which there's nothing wrong with horror. It's just not typically what I write. But people who've read the first three and then they read this one, they're like, well, this one is darker, and it's like, well. So I was in a lot of pain and, and I think there might've been some frustration when, you know, when you're trying to deal with all this stuff and why, you know, they'll try not to have a pity party. Like, why did this happen to me? But part of it is like, man, I really did not need this, all this stuff going on in my life right now. So yeah, droplets is a bit darker. <laughs> huh. Interesting. Well, um, speaking of marketing, I wanted to touch on one thing, which I loved, which is a video on your website setting up the whole series that is oh very... the, tr the book trailer yeah the book trailer i mean yeah the, that's pretty snazzy what did you who did that for you oh gosh so that was a friend of a friend who did that several years ago and i should use that more because i actually really loved it too yeah um and i have lost touch with her because i would love to give her a shout out um and i can't think of her name right now um yeah the book the hardest part about that is it is impossible to find people running on video that are not like doing a run for exercise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, we tried to do the deer, little deer scare scene as like a, like, oh, a scary thing. And a lot of people were like, oh, what, what is it? Why were there deer? Well, we couldn't find people running yeah. um, besides like trail running. And that wasn't the point, but no, yeah, I love, I do love that. Um, that book trailer was awesome. Yeah. Very cool. It sort of sets up the whole, um, just yeah, it was a nice little touch of humor there about about the lousy witch. I think I would, that the way you dropped in that line was very nice. Well, yeah. I do tend to, I do tend to like to have sort of snarky characters and people saying, "I grew up with four brothers. Like we were a very sarcastic household. Um, yeah. My kids are all sarcastic, um, and so I and I just I like to have you know, you've got the tension, but I like to have a little drop of humor to maybe break that just slightly." Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, speaking of marketing, um, also the other thing that we want to talk about is this newsletter class you've got coming up through online university, RMFW online university, starting in a couple of weeks on June 1st. Um, <clears throat> I assume you being a proponent of newsletters that you have one and have some experience with them. And I, I have, do. yeah, yeah. I have um, I, lots of friends who really, really believe in them. And um, I personally have been haphazard about it. And I know you need to be, you need to be steady if you're going to start a newsletter. Yeah. And actually, because the reason I took the, the board position of co-communications chair for RMFW was because newsletters scared. Oh, they just scared me to death. And I had two books out and no newsletter. Um, and then um a friend of mine who was, she was a secretary at the time, um, Sherry Mertz, she, she said, there's a position open. And I was like, well, yeah, that's the worst position for me. I don't know anything about newsletters. Um, but so I, I do usually like to challenge myself. And so it's like, all right, this scares me. So this is something I need to learn. So I took over RMFW's newsletter and did that for almost two years up to last um, December. It just got to be a lot. Um, but it taught me Cause sending it out to, you know, 3000 plus people. And it's like, you know, your, your fears, I'm like, oh my gosh, what if I make a grammatical error? What if I, you know, and it kind of got me over that fear. Plus it gave me, there was always content. Like I didn't have to come up with the content. 
Right. And I learned, I learned cause uh, I learned how to use MailChimp really, really well. Um, but that was something that challenged me. So then I started my own newsletter and realized that, um, you know, it's all about cultivating relationships because you get, I will get emails from people about the goofiest things. And what I really wanted to focus on, not only on uh, how to build a newsletter and how to do it, but in this class is like, you know, okay, what do you say when, I mean, it's easy to have a book, have book news, like, oh, I have a release or I have a cover reveal, or I've got, you know, this or that or happening with a book. But what do you say when you don't have any book news? Like maybe you're pre-published or like with me had a very, very long dry spell where I didn't have anything coming out. Um, so, you know, coming up with, with things to send to people in those times can be really challenging, but you would, knowing your audience first is really important, but be amazed. We had a foster kitty, um, that we were fostering and, um, he was, he was the subject of my newsletter, I think three or four times. And we actually found somebody to adopt him in Denver. Um, because and he was just, he was such a sweet little guy. Um, his name was Finn, but that was, he was a subject of my newsletter. Like, and it was funny because the three kitties were sitting, were laying in a circle with their paws in. And I'm like, I think they're having a seance, you know, cause I write witches and, you know, it was really silly, goofy stuff. So it's not like you have to have the book cover reveals or the release dates coming up or, but it consistency is really big. And I did see um, when I was having a couple of my surgeries and I missed say three weeks, my open rates went down considerably. So I write my newsletter weekly for myself. Um, it's also going through and weeding through the people who are really interacting. Um, and and I, would, I would much rather have a, a 1000 person mailing list that is highly interactive than a 10,000 person mailing list with people who never open my email, obviously, because there's mm -hmm. going to be those people that sign up and then they never open it. Um, right. But it's, I mean, it really is something that if you break it down, you know, and I think in my class, I'll be going through and, and showing how to format, how to, you know, get the pictures in there, what to look for. So it doesn't just have this enormous picture that's trying to pop up on somebody's page. Um, and it will be MailChimp based just because that's what RMFW uses. That's what I use. It's not yeah. that we're getting paid by MailChimp. It's just that's, and actually yeah. if you go through and look, they have the highest number of subscribers you can have before you have to start paying. Cause yeah. you can have 2000 subscribers without having to pay anything. That's great. Um, so, and then how to, and then how to get those, get those people signing up. And there's a couple different ways you can do that, but we're going to go over all of that in the class um, and kind of just break it down. And um, I've got examples of my newsletters that actually like, you know, hit really well. One was a picture of just like fall trees. And I had three people email me. They're like, oh, I moved away in the desert. And oh, I just love this picture. Thank you so much. It just made my day. I'm like, wow, goofy stuff, you know. Um, so it doesn't have to be super heavy or super relevant to, every, to your writing process or talking about aspects of your books or your themes. You can... Just you're just opening a channel with your audience. Kind of, yeah. And it's, it's giving them a little bit of a peek into your life. We because um we've gotten a puppy, and I I mean pictures of Gunner in my newsletter a lot too because he's just a dork. Um, but I actually would more suggest staying away from, um, like oh this is how you write a good scene or the people who are reading the newsletter typically are not going to be writers, so they don't really you know, necessarily care about, you know, what a good character arc looks like, um, you know, and, and just, you know, if, you're, if you go on a trip and you have some cool vacation pictures or putting those up, um, there's a lot of different subjects, but like I said, too, you also have to know your audience. Um, even though I write YA, my audience is, um, oh gosh, 60% women over the age of 55. Um, and that's something actually too, that it helps when you have a newsletter, because a lot of them will let you know what that demographic is. So you kind of know what you're aiming for. And then you, you get your snazzy, you, you try to come up with a snazzy lot, um, subject line. And of course, free always gets clicked, but you don't necessarily want the people who only care about free. You want the people who are going to buy your book. Um, so, you know, just doing free or giveaways, um, you know, that's, that's not necessarily where you want to go. Um, they do get more, they'll do get a lot of opens with that, but having goofy ones, like, I don't know. I had some really goofy ones, you know, what's brewing in the cauldron this week. I don't know. There was some silly ones mm -hmm. that were kind of witch themed, but it, it definitely depends on your, what you're writing and 
if you can figure out if you've found your audience or if you even have any idea of your audience most of ya's audience is older which is you know as funny as older people but um yeah or if, i mean i've had guys who are 75 years old email me about my books um mm. that i didn't realize you know that they would enjoy them but multiple times and i'm like oh, that's awesome you right. know and it, it just gives you that relationship with your readers. And then it can help you find people if you're looking for beta readers once you are ready to publish. It can help you find ARC readers so you can get some reviews up. And you can kind of weed out the people who will really follow through and, and yeah. you know, do what you're going to need them to do and, and establish those relationships. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think they are highly, highly, uh, not, they're not like at well. I would say they're one of the easier thing. I have way easier time with newsletters now than I do with like Instagram and, <laughs> yeah. and coming up with posts on there. Like my newsletter is, is way easier for me. And now I think I spend maybe a typically an hour a week, maybe doing it. So it's not hugely, once you get it all set up and you have your header and you just, you know, are plugging in new things. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot of your time up. All right. How, how is your month class going to be structured, Emily? How do you, how are you going to run the course? So it's, um, we're thinking it's going to be self-paced. Um, I okay. do, um, I liked because it's, it's so hard to explain, like find this button over here to do. So I think what I'm going to be doing is doing a lot of um, like videos of my screen and showing people probably using my own newsletter, like here, you know, I'm building this this week. So going through the process to show how I'm doing this. And then going back, um, cause I did do a class with this at the conference. And I had a whole um, PowerPoint that had some really good screenshots where I could black out you know, people's information to show people where to look, to see if people are opening your newsletter. Cause you can look and see it. Are they opening it? Are they clicking it? Um, so it's, it's gonna be self-paced and I'll be there for any questions. Um, I might um, set up to see if, um, if people wanna have like a, a live zoom time once like a couple hours if they have anything they want to go through yeah um and and kind of go from there and i think i think when christian and i talked about we were starting it on the 14th not the first oh, okay. i'm not okay. sure i think it was the 14th um okay. so yeah but i'm hoping and we you know we tried to keep the cost reasonable because we want to get as many people in there as we can um, cause it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great subject. And I think it's something that feels so overwhelming and it, I'm not going to be judgy because I was the person who had two books out and no newsletter at all. So right. I'm not, you know, I'm not judging anybody here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. ah, that'd be so hypocritical. I was way behind the eight ball, you know? Um, but you know, now I keep my, I keep my newsletter to a few thousand people and, and have a, a good open rate. And I go through through and weed out the people who aren't interacting because they aren't doing anything for me it's kind of like planning for gold you want to find those little nuggets and get rid of all that sand so there you go (laughs) that's great well emily this is great Uh, thanks for the rundown um and uh for folks wanting to sign up for the class just head to rmfw.org and um search for the online university and yours is the next class in the queue i do believe I think uh, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, best of luck with the writing. We didn't, I didn't uh, give you any advance notice, but we usually wrap these podcasts up by giving our guests a chance to recommend a book that you've read recently, another writer you love reading, uh, anything. It could be a big name, little name, doesn't matter, just paying it forward a little bit. Oh, goodness. Um, let's see. So I just recently um, arc read The Leopard of, is it the leopard of Bar- Barcoa for Piper Baird for um, it's Baird and Holmes. Um, that is, if you like suspense, and st- that's an awesome book. You can definitely tell that they know the places and they get you in these foreign locations really, really quickly. Um, and that's not even my, my typical genre, but um, what was the, that, what's the name of the writer? Uh, it's, it's, so it's Piper Baird. So they go under Baird and Holmes. Um, so that would be one. And then I just started um, Daisha Arnold's series, her dia- diasm series. So I'm getting pulled into the, I love that she uses a mom as her main character because I feel like that's almost a taboo thing in a lot of writing because 
you know, kids just weigh you down. You can't do anything fun. <laughs> but so those are two that I've read recently that are both RMFW members. And um, as far as big books right now, I'm um, like from, you know, best, you know, New York Times bestselling authors. I think I'm the War of Two Queens is what I'm reading right now. And that series, it's the War, the War of Two what? Queens. Um, Jennifer, Jennifer L. Armentrout. It's the fourth in her series. Um, okay. That one definitely pulls you in. She can, she knows, she knows how to get a captivating story and some very interesting characters. So. Well, well Emily, we wish you all the best, wish you a full recovery um, as soon as you can, as soon as you and your doctors can get on top of that. We wish you 100% recovery as fast as possible. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And congratulations on the book uh, release and uh, we will catch up with you down the road. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm.